I invite you to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 8. Acts the 8th chapter. As you're getting situated, our memory verse from Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 is on the board. And Russ did an outstanding job this morning presenting this topic. Jesus as our high priest. You don't mind saying this with me. Hebrews 7, 25. Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Last Sunday night, I preached a lesson on baptism and really what I tried to do was take the 30,000 feet view and more or less take all the little puzzle pieces that lay the foundation for baptism in the New Testament and connect those dots for you. And so I hope that that was beneficial, but the reason I bring it up now is that was the groundwork for this lesson. So this is probably the lesson you're more accustomed to to hearing when you talk about baptism in the New Testament. But I would encourage you, if for some reason you did not hear last Sunday night's lesson, please go back and listen to it. Because again, I say, that's the foundation for what we're talking about tonight. Acts chapter 8, in verse 26 through 39, is a very well-known section of Scripture. What I'd like to begin doing is just read it, and we'll more or less have this as our hitching post tonight. Place your bookmark here. We're going to leave it a whole bunch but we'll more or less come back to this general area. This is Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 26. And an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south to the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, had come to Jerusalem to worship. He was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. And Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you're reading? He said to him, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb silent before its shears, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture preached Jesus to him. And as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. And when they had come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Now that is an absolutely well-known story, not just because it's in the Bible, but because of some of the information that it teaches us. We know the story well. So often the question really comes up among Christians though, especially parents, maybe I should say, clarify. Is my child ready to obey the gospel? Now you may not be a child, so this may be you that I'm talking to. Are you ready to obey the gospel? Are you ready to be baptized for the remission of your sins. Baptism is one of those very interesting topics. As we noticed last Sunday night, you can trace that usage of water through the scriptures as God used it to redeem and save his people, those who responded to him in faith and submitted to the, or had the response of obedience to him. But in the world today, that's not necessarily what we see. In fact, if you were to ask if you were to ask, let's just say, poll 10 of your religious friends that are from the denominational world, in some cases not even from the denominational world, what would their response be about baptism? Well, 
You're born needing it. That might be one response you would get, because you're born in sin. I'm, by the way, just to clarify, I'm saying that that's what they may say. <laughs> so you might be born needing it. They, they might say that, well, it's a good thing to do, but you don't necessarily need to do it. They might even say that you do it, and then you are doing it essentially as a sign that you've already been saved. So you're saved and then baptized. And, and then there are a lot of other really fancy theories out there about what it is and what it does and how it works and why you do it and all these different things. And again, you go ask 10 different people and you're probably going to get 8 to 10 different responses. Now, let's throw all that out because I don't care what they say. What does the Bible say? Amen. Now, let's hitch our horse to that car. <laughs> That's where we want to be. Because if you go and talk to all those buddies out there and all your friends out there, folks, you're going to get a, a wide range of answers, not just on baptism, folks. You, you've got people in the religious world today who claim to be Christians who don't believe that Jesus is really God. Do you want that person teaching you about baptism? No, no, no. Get your nose in the book. Let's find out what this thing says. And so I want to make this brief disclaimer. We're going to be doing a lot of turning tonight. I kind of warned you last Sunday night that that would be the case tonight. And these may be some things you are struggling with as your children are growing up, and it may be things you yourself are struggling with. I don't know. I hope to kind of cover this thing wide enough and paint with a large enough brush that I can hit everybody a little bit. That's my goal anyways. And so... I want us to ask the question as we begin, what is baptism? Now, we see it administered here in Acts chapter 8, but what is it? Well, it's immersion. Okay, sure, sure, sure. We can see the definition, but what is it? Now, for that, let's go to Mark 16. Mark the 16th chapter, Mark 16. As the gospel of Mark is concluding... The last words that he records in the Gospel of Mark, or at least that Mark records him speaking, here's Mark chapter 16. He's appeared to the disciples. He's about to ascend to the throne of glory. And in verse 15, he tells them, you go into all the world and you preach the Gospel to all, creature, all creation, all creatures. Verse 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. Now, one thing I want you to notice about baptism, and maybe we should start from the negative standpoint, it is not, it is not a consecration of a baby. Now, that is a practice that we see around us in the world today, but notice again, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. You, you notice something else about baptism? Jesus is the one who talked about it here. Now, I don't care if Jesus is the one saying it or if it's one of the apostles later because it all comes from the same source. That's God Almighty. But what I want you to appreciate is we have it in the Scriptures that baptism is right here based on somebody who believes and is baptized shall be saved. That's not man saying that. That's not Church of Christ doctrine like I mentioned last Sunday night. It's Jesus Christ. It's His apostles saying that. So this is not some creed of man. This is not some denominational creed. This is from God Himself. Notice something else about the way that Jesus says this. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. I know you know the verse very well. You, you notice something it doesn't say? He who believes is saved and is baptized later doesn't say that, though, does it? Now, this is a very simple concept to New Testament Christians. I get that. But it's fundamental, folks. This is fundamental for reasons, the foundations. It's, it's, it's understanding the Scriptures. It's the basics of who we are. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Not a creed of man, nor... Is it saved and then baptized at some later date? That's not what Jesus is talking about here. Flip over to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. 
I want to stress one more time that the foundation for this lesson was last Sunday night. Because <laughs> I hate proof text preaching. I don't like it. Sometimes it's got to be done, but I'm not a fan. Acts 2.38. At the end of Peter's message here in Acts chapter 2, the first message of the gospel essentially as he's proclaiming the good news that Jesus Christ conquered death, that he arose and ascended to the right hand of God Almighty as Russ spoke about this morning. And now he serves as our high priest and our king. And notice verse 38. Peter said, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, I know most of us can quote that verse, but do you understand what it's not teaching? It's not teaching that this is simply an outward sign of some kind of inward change. That's not what Peter's talking about. I made an observation. I don't remember if it was last Sunday night or last Sunday morning. You realize a lot of the problems in the denominational world and in in the way the denominational world understands Scripture is they take a concept they already believe in and they bring it into a passage. Well, that can't be what that says. That cannot be for the remission of sins because I don't believe in that for the remission of sins. You see, that's a problem. I mentioned that that's essentially a systematic approach to the Bible. And even though Russ and I don't ever say this, what we advocate is a biblical approach to the Bible so that we can take the Scriptures and make sure we interpret this verse to be in, or be in uh, harmony with all the other verses we look at in Scripture. And if they're not, we understood one of them wrong. Or maybe multiple Scriptures wrong. This is in harmony, even when we're not. We need to appreciate that. Peter doesn't say this is an outward sign of an inward change. You guys were already cut to the heart. That's what it says in verse 37. They heard the message. They were cut to the heart. You're already cut to the heart. Now you just need to be baptized to show everyone else that you were cut to the heart. (laughs) It's not what he says, folks. He says, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, that's just a few of the knots. Uh, N-O-T, by the way, not K-N-O-T. Let me give you a few of the is's. Notice how Peter says this. This is for the remission of sins. For the remission of sins. It is to take away sins, to remove sins. It's because of sin, folks, that baptism is administered. Now, I've kind of belabored that point already. If there is no sin, now I'm going to want you to pocket this till later in the discussion. If there is no sin, then there is no point in the person being baptized. Now let me say that again. If there is no sin, then there is no point to be baptized. You pocket that. We'll come back to it in just a minute. 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. I brought this passage up as we draw the connections from Noah to our baptism today as these things connect with one another. He says, this is 1 Peter 3 verse 21, there is also an antitype which now saves us, namely baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see this now. There is an antitype which now saves us, baptism. I was having a study. In fact, it was one of the first studies I had with somebody way before I started preaching. A couple of boys that worked with me on the ranch. I I got them to agree to a study. Both of them, good guys, I got them to agree to study with me. One of them said, hey, my girlfriend's going to be there. I said, that's no big deal, more the merrier. They didn't tell me she was a denominational preacher's daughter. Uh, Not only did she know her stuff pretty well, she believed her stuff pretty well. It didn't take very long of a conversation before she was pretty worked up. Believe it or not, I kept my cool. I've never been cool in my life, but what little cool I had, I kept it that night. 
as I'm having this conversation with her, mainly it was just her, those boys were just, she got worked up and they just sat there. They, they didn't want any part of this conversation anymore. As we were having this discussion, she made the comment, you can't tell me that baptism saves. And I thought, let's look at this passage, 1 Peter 3, 21. She said, that's water. It doesn't do anything. And I said, well, let's look at this verse. There is an antitype which now saves us, namely baptism. And I said, here's what's so funny. Peter even says, it's not a bath. He said, it's not for the removal of the filth of the flesh. It's the answer of a good conscience towards God. And don't skip over that last line. Notice that. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's where it all connects, folks. By the way, the conversation was done after that. She made some observation about if water saves, then all the cows out there in that pasture will be saved. And I, well, I cows can't believe. Cows don't have sin. Cows don't have a soul. But a whole lot of theological issues if you're going to take that argument. Not everybody wants to hear that, folks. Peter said... This connects you to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, this issue has been debated forever. J.W. Kessner, you can look this up, by the way. J.W. Kessner was a denominational preacher. He was a doctor. He met Ward Hoagland. Russell recognized some of these names. Ward Hoagland, in 1950, in a debate at Fort Smith, Arkansas, Ward Hoagland was 26 years old and Kessner was twice his age and a doctor. <laughs> but Ward challenged him to a debate. Ward's a gospel preacher who's 96 years old and still preaches full-time. So they met for this debate, 800 or 1,000 people a night. As they're having this discussion, 1 Peter 3 comes up. And Kessner, who did not believe in baptism for the remission of sins, makes the observation, well, Brother Hoagland has not once proved to me that baptism saves. And so Hoagland on the front row said, can I show you now? He said, sure. So he runs and grabs the chalk. Now I'm not using the chalk. This is going to blow some of y'all's minds because y'all didn't know what was back here, I'm sure. Ta-da! And so, Brother Hoagland goes to the blackboard. And I, and I want you to consider these two sentences he writes down, if you can read my handwriting. Can you all read that okay? I know you can't. You're looking at the podium. Can you read that okay? Now, I want you to ask you a question. Baptism does not now save. I didn't write now. Oh, I did. sure did. It's right there. If it's a snake, it bit me. Is that what the verse says, though? Now, now just break away all of, the, all of the baggage we bring into the discussion. B break away from all of the misconceptions that are out there in the religious world. Break away from everything that every preacher's ever told you. Break away from everything that every denomination's ever told you. Come away from all that your mom and dad taught you. What does the verse say? There is an antitype which now saves us. Does baptism save? I didn't trouble y'all with writing the other sentence. It was taking me too long. Handwriting's atrocious. Y'all were going to call the hospital on me and say there's a loony escaped. Baptism now saves. Now I want you to appreciate. Not only is it an act of obedience, it is a burial. You see that here in verse 21. Now go to Romans chapter 6. Romans the 6th chapter. Romans, the sixth chapter. Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Or 
Or do you not know that as many of us, as were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried. Notice that now. Underline if you have to. That we were buried with him by baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, now, I know we know this verse, but again, I want you to see this connects us to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's exactly what 1 Peter 3.21 says. You want to connect to the resurrection, that hope of eternal life? Baptism. Baptism is what connects it. And yes, that does rule out sprinkling because it's a burial. I've been to a lot of funerals lately, folks. I've been to a few graveside services lately. I've still yet to see them take dirt and just sprinkle it on top of the casket and call it good. It's a burial. It's a going in too. We can't lose sight of that. It is a part of our resurrection. And also, I want you to consider, go back to Acts chapter 8. This is Acts the 8th chapter. Acts chapter 8. Now I want you to see this. As the eunuch is reading this place in the scriptures in verse 32, it shows the passage in which he's reading, Isaiah the 53rd chapter. He asks the question in verse 34, who is this man speaking of? Verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. I know you've heard these points made many times before, but folks, it may be new for someone else. Let's always keep that in mind, by the way. I know some topics, it's like, why are we talking about this again? Well, we need the reminder, and it may be new for someone. He preached Jesus to him. The natural result of preaching Jesus, do you see that? The next verse. They're traveling down the road. Here is some water, verse 36. And the eunuch says... Now that's the eunuch. The eunuch's drawing some conclusions from what this, this pre preacher is saying. And he says, here's some water. What hinders me from being baptized? These connect, folks. The preaching of Christ in verse 35 and the question of baptism in verse 36. I know sometimes we have limited what, what preaching Christ is. But folks, preaching Christ is not just about talking or just talking about the man of Galilee. It's more than that. It's a whole lot more than that. Paul makes that admonition. Preaching Christ means preaching the new life, which is going to, well, I'm going to give you a free advertisement here. That's our theme next year, the new man, Ephesians 4, 5, and 6. That's what preaching Christ is, folks. It's about preaching about Him, the man of Nazareth. It's about preaching about what He did, the high priest of our confession. It's about preaching on what He had accomplished in those things and what we should do as a response to it. So preaching Christ covers a whole gamut of what we are to be as New Testament people and as we are to be the new person in Christ. We need to remember that. Here it includes water baptism. Now I want you to appreciate what I've shown you is not my opinion. I had these really cool little bubbles on there that gave names and things. I, I hated it. Wasn't that cool I guess if I hated it. You go back and look at the passages we draw these conclusions from. It's Mark 16, 16. The words of Jesus. Acts 2, 38. The words of the Apostle Peter. Or Peter in 1 Peter. Or Paul in Romans chapter 6, and I didn't bring up Colossians 2 where he talks about a burial in baptism, but it's the same thing, Colossians 2, 12. Paul's saying it. The inspired men of God, Jesus himself. These are conclusions you come to from what they said. I like my opinion, but it ain't worth nothing with your soul. I like Russ's opinion. I don't listen to it all that often, but I like it. I'm kidding, I listen a lot to Russ. Folks, this is what God's Word says. Now, I know you're, you're thinking, man, that was a fast sermon. Well, that was all groundwork to get to this. <laughs> Look at Acts chapter 2 again. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. So if we've already determined that this is a response of a person who is in sin, that's what we've determined. You don't need to be baptized if you haven't sinned. 
The question needs to be asked is when have I sinned? That's the question they ask in verse 30, not when, but question in verse 36. After they hear this conclusion, they realize what they've done, that they have sinned. There's the kicker. They ask in verse 37, men and brethren, what shall we do? They ask that question because they recognize they were in sin. Sin is a transgression of God's will. If you've not transgressed God's will or God's word, then you're not a sinner. You're not guilty of sin. You don't need to be baptized. But the question is, when does that take place? That's a violation of His will. It separates us from God. That's Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. When does it happen? Now again, this is where we get into a little bit of an issue sometimes. There are some groups out there that believe that this happens at birth. You're born separated from God. I'm going to tell you something, folks. That that presents a challenge. For one, it contradicts the understanding of God throughout the entire Bible. Because, well, for one, it's a Calvinistic viewpoint. Mark 16, 16, he said, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Or in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, Repent and be baptized. Can a child do that? Can a baby do that? One of the more fascinating stories that I think proves this point very well, is after David commits his sin with Bathsheba, she is with child, the child is born, and the child is struck with illness and dies. You remember David's comment? Oh, he's in agony. He's he's uh, mourning this child. He is in, in pain. As soon as his servants come and tell him what has happened, they say, the child is dead. Well, they remember they were afraid to tell him. He's he's been like this before. What's going to happen now? His comment has stood with me for a long time. He gets up, he dusts himself off. He quits mourning and they ask why. His comment is, I maybe can go and see him. He's not going to come back to me, but I can go and see him. Now, here's your problem if you believe in Calvinism. Is David saying that I can maybe go to hell? Child born, if a child is born in sin, that would be a conclusion you'd have to come to. Child born sick, child dies. If Calvinism's true, child's dead and goes to hell. You see, there's a problem. It's inconsistent. Now, if you take the viewpoint that babies aren't born, born, aren't born, if you take the viewpoint that babies aren't born in sin as the Bible teaches that they are not, Well, then David's comment makes a whole lot of sense. Maybe I can go and be with him. When am I accountable before God? Because there's obviously a point where I'm not. Obviously a point when I'm not. Now here's the question I think pertains to maybe you, and it may be you who have children. So you have a child that knows this stuff that recognizes the points we've made tonight, that recognizes the passages. They seem to be asking the right questions. But when do I know this person is ready? Or maybe as the eunuch asked in Acts chapter 8 and verse 36, what hinders me from being baptized? This is a a part of the discussion I don't know if we always have. There are reasons to not get baptized. Now, I want you to listen very carefully before you think I'm a heretic because I'm going to give you three. These are times a parent should say, not yet. Acts chapter 8, please. Acts chapter 8. This is where we began. And essentially, this is the question that the eunuch asked Philip. Verse 36. Here is water. What hinders me? What should stop me from being baptized? Verse 37, Philip said, notice this now, if you believe, if you believe with all your heart, you may. I want to suggest to you, belief is a prerequisite for baptism. If you don't believe, baptism's not going to help you. Baptism's not going to change that unbelief. 
Folks, you, you got to believe the message. It's exactly what Philip says to the eunuch here. If you believe, then you can do this. You can be baptized for remission of your sins, but you've got to believe in Jesus Christ. You've got to believe that such a thing as sin exists. And let me say, not some arbitrary out there problem. As Russ hammered on this morning, which, boy, that was awesome how that connects so well tonight. My sin. You're not ready to be baptized if you don't understand that this is for my sin, not somebody else's or the world at large. Mine. Until you understand, until you believe that Jesus Christ died for me, I'm being baptized as an obedient response to that. Until you believe that, folks, dunking in that water is not going to help you. All you did was take a public bath with a bunch of clothes on and, and it didn't change anything. You've got to believe the message. It's exactly where he starts with here. In fact, it is what Jesus said he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. You take belief out of that discussion and just get baptized, no bueno. No bueno. Another thing I, I would suggest to you that kind of piggybacks into that is understanding. Now, I want you to appreciate that this really goes beyond just a belief. A belief that these things happen, or a belief that this is what happens, it comes down to an understanding that this is why. I think that's implied in what Philip says to the eunuch. You believe and understand. Because that's typically, those two are normally interwoven in some sense in the biblical language. Belief implies understanding and a response to it. you got to understand what you're doing. One of the things I'm afraid far too many people who get baptized don't understand is not just their sin and not just their response to Jesus Christ, not just their obedience. I think the biggest problem that people don't understand when they get baptized is what the new life will look like. And that's a learning curve. You're going, I'm going to tell you right now where I'm at today. When I obeyed, I was thinking about it earlier today. I obeyed the gospel 20 years ago. Almost 20 years. I had no idea what I was getting into. I understood some of the basic concepts. Did I know that was going to make me a preacher? And that it, I was going to end up moving away from my home and my family who has all lived in three counties in southeast Oklahoma all of my life? And the generations before me, did I know it was going to make me put up my boots and chaps and cowboy hat? <laughs> no. There's a lot of things that you may do now that when you take on this commitment to Christ, you will not do again. We've got to make sure we're impressing that on our friends, on our loved ones, and on our children. This is a new life in Christ which in part, I think, is why we're doing the theme next year. I'm excited about our theme, a new man. Folks, that newness affects all aspects of your life, not just a Sunday morning, not just a casual attendance, not just a casual, I don't cuss sometimes. I mean, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Not just a sometimes I'll wear modest clothes. Folks, this decision will impact every other decision you will make for the rest of your life. We've got to make sure we understand that concept. And I know that for the most part, especially if I'm talking to the younger ones, you're not going to understand all of that. But we've got to understand something of what it means to become new and what it means to change, what it means to develop and draw near to God. I want you to appreciate a lot of this will really take wisdom on your part. As a parent, because I know I am talking to parents whose kids are asking questions right now, your wisdom is going to have to step into this discussion because I don't know your kid. You do. And some of this is trial and error. And what do I know? My kids are pretty young. So all I'm giving you is general observations. I've got one more. And this one, again, kind of connects to this. 
especially children who grow up in the church. They grow up believing this. They grow up generally understanding these things, but they have no idea what kind of a commitment it is. I, I never will forget, I won't tell you which one of my kids, but you got a 50-50 shot. One of them was about four, and we had a particular individual who wanted to obey the gospel. One of the kids, I believe he was 11 or 12 or 13, whatever he was, I forget now. But it was late at night, and so I load the kids up in pajamas, and off we go to the church building to meet them and several others because we wanted to be there to sing and, and hug his neck and, and pray for him and so forth. And I never will forget, six months after that, my four-year-old is asking me, Dad, can I get baptized? Can I get baptized? Can I get baptized? She knew. She knew that that was what she was supposed to do. She saw it done. I said, well, baby, you don't need to get baptized yet. Well, why not, Dad? Well, hon, for one thing, you haven't sinned yet. Well, Dad, let me sin, and I'll go and I'll go and get baptized. No, 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 no. No, 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 you're approaching this all wrong. Let's rein it back in. That was actually the conversation, by the way. I didn't make that up. That was the real conversation. I hope I never forget it. You see, the problem sometimes is they grow up knowing these things, and now, Mom and Dad, you're going to have to step in and, and, and check. You're going to have to step in and ask the right questions. Some of this stuff needs to be coming up anyways as you're sitting down and studying the Bible with those babies. Because I'm going to tell you something, folks. They need to be studying with you. If all they're getting is me and Russ yelling at them from the pulpit, they're not getting enough. By the way, if, you're, if that's all you're getting, you're not getting enough. But we need to be asking these right questions and sitting down and talking to them, understanding what this impacts and understanding how it will impact them. This will change where they go to school. This will change what kind of job they get. This will change, in some cases, who they choose to marry. This will change the way they dress. This will change the way they talk. Now, really what I'm describing is the idea of repentance, if you want my just clear-cut point. But all these things are part of burying that old person to become the new person in Christ and forevermore. That maturity, folks, is, is needed before those kids put on Christ in baptism. They've got to have some understanding of what sin has done or they cannot really be buried from it. This commitment, I want to flip this just a second. This commitment, folks, is something that needs to be impressed upon them, but I also want to stress this. As I've just talked about in some ways, and I know some of the older kids are listening and thinking, all you've described is negative. <laughs> I can't go there, and I can't do that, and I can't wear this, and I can't say that, and I can't, and it's all this can't, 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 no, 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 no. But I want you to get this. You kids that just obeyed the gospel, you kids that will obey the gospel, you kids that are thinking about obeying the gospel, maybe some of your older people that are thinking about obeying the gospel, while this commitment may cost you every ounce of this temporal life, it comes with a greater reward than you can conceptually imagine. I want you to look at something. This is Romans chapter 12. Russ was all over the book of Romans this morning. I, I want you to see this. Because I know every kid in here for the most part has grown up hearing these Bible stories. They grew up hearing about Samson. And they grew up hearing about Samuel and Abraham and David and all these great heroes. Well, that's what chapter 11 in Hebrews is about. But I want you to see this. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1. Therefore, because of what he's just talked about, all those heroes, therefore, seeing we also are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, 
let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now, I want you to, I want you to see this. That great cloud of witnesses. Yes, this commitment to Christ will come at a high cost, higher than you can possibly imagine. But when you see the reward, this great cloud of witnesses, it's going to be worth it, folks. You ever wanted to talk to David? Some of you kids that have grown up in these awesome Bible classes and played with the slingshots. I know my kids have had a blast with them. Have you ever wanted to talk to David? He's there as the great cloud of witnesses. He's in that group. You ever wanted to ask him what it was like to stand up to Goliath? Or what about Abraham? Abraham, what was going through your mind while you stood there with Isaac and the raised knife? Or maybe Sarah. How could you call him Lord all that time? I throw that in for the ladies. You ever wanted to talk to Caleb? Or Moses? Moses, what was the thoughts going through your mind as soon as you threw down the two tablets of stone? Whoops. I'm in trouble now. What was going through your mind while you stood at the foot of Sinai? What did you see when you looked at God as He walked past you in the cleft of the rock? Folks, that's the great cloud of witnesses. We need to remind ourselves and remind our children that this is costful, yes. This is difficult, yes. This is challenging, yes. But the reward is greater than we can imagine. I want to ask you this. This is where I'll leave it with. If you believe these things, if you have an understanding of some of these things, if you understand the commitment that's required of serving Christ, what are you waiting on? No time like the present. I'll throw this in. You don't necessarily have to come forward right here in front of everybody. I know for some kids, that's, I'd rather die. Just put me out of my misery. I do not want to walk out in front of everybody. I get that. But don't wait. Don't put it off. If you're not one of those ones I just described, get to it. If we can help you in some way tonight, we would beg of you, to come forward and make that known as we stand and as we sing.